Hello, bonjour. My name is Megan, and on behalf of the Ottawa Art Gallery, I would like to welcome you to our virtual OAG Artist Talk with artist John Healy. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that the Ottawa Art Gallery operates on the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin Nation. In this video, I am pleased to introduce John Healy. Recipient of the 2020 Project X Photography Award, John grew up along the St. Lawrence River in Brockville, Ontario. His work has been shown nationally at the Scotiabank Contact Photography Festival and selected images from his Plastic Beach series have been recognized in competitions, including Backflash Magazine's Optic Nerve Image Contest and FigureWorks 2019. John lives and works in Ottawa. Works from his award-winning series can now be seen on view at the OAG in the exhibition Project X Award, Plastic Beach by John Healy, presented by the OAG, SPAO, and the Ottawa Arts Council. This exhibition will be on view in the OAG Sky Lounge until Wednesday, November 25th. I would also like to mention that you can join us on the OAG's Instagram Live on Friday, November 13th at 4 p.m. for a live conversation between John and Catherine Sinclair, OAG's Deputy Director and Chief Curator, where they will be chatting together and you can ask questions in a live setting as well. Thank you so much for tuning in. And without further ado, I would like to hand the screen over to John. Hello, hi, my name is John Healy. I'm the 2020 Project X Award winner. And before I get going into talking about the award and the work, um, I'd like to just recognize that this particular video is being recorded on Algonqu unceded Algonquin and Anishinaabe territory. I'd also like to mention before we get going that um, it's an honor to win this award. Um, this award is sponsored and hosted by the Ottawa Art Gallery, the Ottawa Arts Council, and the School of Photographic Arts Ottawa, or also known as SPAO. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, I am an emerging artist. I've been working as a photographer for less than eight years. Seriously, uh, I was always into it as a hobby, but um, never seriously, not an everyday um, type of occurrence that, that it is now in my life. Um, and it is um, a great um, source of creative outlet for me. Um, I really quite enjoy it. Um, and I encourage everyone to participate in the arts and be creative as they possibly can. Um, my influences are pretty wide ranging. Um, I'm not a young, young man anymore. Um, so I've seen a lot. Um, you know, the classic ones, Picasso, Francis Bacon, um, many, many different artists have um, influenced me um, and those are just you know some really basic straightforward ones um, as far as photographers go um, of course we have Irving Penn who I admire quite a bit Ed Bertinsky um, those two are quite uh, high up on the list Ansel Adams had his own way which I appreciate um, and there's a few others um, and those those are, are the main ones that I keep going back to. Um, Sugimoto, uh, Horatio Sugimoto is a, is one that I also rather enjoy. And but there there are many many different artists out there that that I look to for inspiration, and, and not just visual artists. I will also look to um, musical artists, classic uh, jazz, rock, um, and you know country and western even and hip-hop and all that kind of stuff it, there's never ending uh, source of inspiration there for me as well um and that's what really occupied my time um when i was growing up was music um uh, i spent quite a bit of time listening to stereos putting together stereos um, and then that eventually um, became my career uh, it isn't until recently that i stopped traveling um, to fulfill that uh, career and try to be successful as I possibly could in that. Um, and it, it was served me very, very well. Um, it prepared me for this part of my life, which is uh, in the arts and, and being creative. And it showed me that you need to be determined and, um, and just keep pushing through when, when things just don't work out the way you think they should work out. And um, 
that I carry into this particular part of uh, my life. Um, as you may know, I grew up uh, in a small town in southern Ontario, Blackfoot, Ontario, and uh, along the river, the St. Lawrence River, and that's where my formative years were. That's um, That really was a, a big part of who I am. Our family was quite large. We had a five children family. We were quite privileged. Um, my mother and father brought arts into the household. Um, right from the beginning, they bought sculpture, they bought painting, they bought a stereo right off the bat. Um, so we were um, indoctrinated into the arts and exposed to the arts at a very young age. And we were encouraged to create and to critically think about what we were creating and what we were hearing or seeing. And that goes a long way in, in um, forming my art, in my art, if you want to call it that, uh, my, my creative uh, process. Um, a lot of that is deep-seated. It's, it's very, very deep within me that, that I draw inspiration from, um, especially when things get a little slow um, maybe if they've plateaued a little bit, I just consider um, all the things that that uh, I was privileged to have when I was younger. So um, if you're growing a young family right now, I encourage you to to buy paintings and expose them to music and, and do what you can. Uh, they'll thank you later, like I have thanked my parents. Um, and then um, through that, um, we grew up and, and my family, I'd like to be really quite proud about it there. My family, my siblings are, are um, accomplished in their fields. Um, they've done very, very well um, beyond what, you know, normally you would think is successful. They've gone beyond that, which is just a tremendous um, thing for me to think about and to, um, and to be proud of really, quite frankly. Um, my work um, in being a photographer um, is more representative. It's it's um, uh, representative of how I'm feeling or what I'm doing or what I'm seeing. Um, and then I try to give people a, a different perspective of these these more or less common day things that that I try to show. And um, what I'll do now is I'll, I'll just uh, switch the screen over and show you a little bit of my work and a couple of projects. So um, my first real critical work um, was this project, which is uh, head on. And this was an homage and honoring my father who passed away very suddenly. Um, and I didn't know that we um, shared um, splattered bug um, or a bug splatter, mind you, um, until one day after he passed away, I was dreaming of him and he was washing his uh, 1972 LTD two-door uh, limited. And um, I remember him in this dream uh, washing the front of his car and commenting on, you know, getting the bug splatter off it. Um, he and I shared uh, this because we both became, uh, in our own times, uh, traveling salespeople. He for the shoe industry and me for electronics. And um, we drifted apart after I became a teenager and I started to, to live on my own. He um, took a different path uh, in his life and settled down in downtown Toronto. He um, but he was always welcoming to me whenever I came into Toronto to do business. In fact, he put me up many nights. Uh, and when he passed away, um, he kept reoccurring in my dreams, just like I had said. And um, I didn't realize that we actually shared this until one day I was washing my car and um, I, you know, doing one of those mindless things, you know, you're on automatic and you're not really thinking about things. And into my mind sprung uh, his image washing his car that I had dreamt. And that uh, stuck with me. And from that point on, I was determined to depict uh, how fleeting life is and how uh, fragile actually we all are. 
And so I decided to um, represent this with um, bug splatter. And so I found out a way to put a, um, a, a plexiglass plate over my license plate. And so when I traveled, I would collect um, and, uh, these bug splatters on that plastic plate. And then I would hold them and then I would bring them into the studio later on and, and recompose them. And this is really the, the project that, that I really started to figure out how this whole photography thing worked um, when it relates to fine art. And um, the great thing about it was that it taught me that you're going to fail more times than you have success. So for instance, here in this photo, uh, this is um, one of my first pieces that I figured out that I could actually do something of, of quality and value. Um, but it took me quite a few attempts to, to get to this point. Uh, and, that, um, and that taught me um, that perseverance. And that as soon as I recognized that I needed to per persevere, um, the old instincts of, of the, my last uh, portion of my life came to the fore and um, it now is, is something that I, I need to realize every time that I go into a shoot that I need to reshoot and and really perfect how it's going to look. So this is an image um, that I shot early on. This is uh, from 2015. This is head-on. Um, this is Montreal to Ottawa. So this was collected between a, a road trip from Montreal uh, back to Ottawa. Uh, the next one here, let's move on. This one's a little different. This one's Ottawa to Sudbury. Um, these generally wouldn't take all that much time to shoot, but I also had to learn a lot of technical things along with this. So I had to learn how to uh, magnify everything um, quite a bit and also to what's called focus stack or take a little slivers of focus and then combine them in the software. Uh, and that took a, a good half year to put together. This is from 2016. And again, this is Ottawa to Sudbury. And then finally, um, something a little bit more abstract. This is, um, this is Toronto to Montreal. Um, in here, we have a fully disintegrated uh, specimen, but it's quite um, uh, an excited or, or violent kind of presentation to it where it's, it's um, not much is recognizable, but you get the sense of the impact. Um, once I started to do this project, I wanted to show it um, like anybody. And what I decided to do was to figure out a way to mount these onto birch panels and then encase them in um, something. And I hunted around and I found um, a relatively clean uh, resin epoxy. Uh, and that's what I coded this work with. Um, and to date, it's been very successful. Um, the resin to me represents the, the windscreen or the plastic of the car or, or the harder surface that, that these bugs would run into. Uh, and I, I found this work to be um, quite inspiring. And it, it made me go back and actually look at a couple of um, unsuccessful projects. And one that I revisited and re-shot and re-published is um, Fasteners. And I'll just move on to that. There we go. As uh, the staples from the Fastener series, this, this makes up, um, this was really a, um, a project that, that I look back on it, it really was a kind of a shocking time, just like the, the head on with my father passing and that whole grieving process. Here with uh, fasteners, I, I, I wanted to look back at a particular moment in my life when I was signing divorce documents uh, in my ex-wife's lawyer's office. And anybody who's done that kind of thing, it can be a little bit of a shock and when you're shocked like that, you tend to fixate on, on, you know, inconsequential things. And to me, all I could really fixate on uh, when I was signing the documents were the staples and the clips and the things that were holding um, these legal documents together. 
And I I didn't realize this until a couple of years after the fact, when I would um, search my memory about this particular incident. And all I could come up with were these um, stationary items that, that held these really big concepts together. And in a way, um, showing me that the family unit was breaking down. And so here we have uh, the staples, I can go on. There's only really about nine um, images for this series. It's a very small, uh, intimate little series. But again, I'm trying to use um, magnification to, to show scale, so the safety pins here. And I really want this to be bigger than what you would normally see. Uh, because the ideas were bigger than what um, um, would be happening on a normal day, right? Not everybody gets divorced every day. Um, so there's the safety pins and then, you know, the, the paper clips are intertwined. Um, so um, these sorts of things are, are um, these two projects for me are quite interesting in that they were inward looking, they were... Um, helping me deal with things like grief and loss and the deterioration of relationships. And um, my wife actually um, suggested at a particular point that I might want to look outside of my experience and look to um, uh, more, more universal um, concepts and, um, and events that were happening around us. So, and, and every year, um, we would go camping and in 2018 we camped uh, in lake superior provincial park and it's a beautiful park it's well maintained um the, the campsites are tremendous um the 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 views and the woods um and the topology is is spectacular um but what got to me was we hiked 10 kilometers into a campsite, which is pretty remote. And the only way to get to that campsite is to either hike or take a kayak or a boat. And when we got there, um, I was struck by how much um, plastic waste was on the beach that we were staying at. And this, this beach only had two campsites and one of them actually was, was overgrown. So it was really only one campsite working here. Um, and this is right at the um, Bay to Devil's Chair. And anybody who's been there before knows that Devil's Chair has um, a very um, important significance to uh, Native Canadian culture. And I was struck when we got there by just how much plastic was on the beach. And this is a not a new thing for us to find. We, we were, I've seen, and we've seen garbage in different campsites, um, many, many different places uh, around Ontario and the rest of Canada. Um, but this one struck me as quite uh, interesting because a lot of the, the waste was coming in directly into the campsite from the water. And I spent the better half, the better part of a day, half a day, the following day, uh, just collecting it up, collecting all this waste. And usually what you would do is to, like any good camper, is you collect the waste, you put it in a bag, you hike it out, you throw it away. Um, I did that. But when I got to the car uh, the following day, I didn't throw it away. I actually threw it in the trunk with the rest of the camping gear. And it struck me just how much in the, the articles that I was finding there. And I was finding things like U.S. military ration bags. I was finding things like um, insulation, six foot size sheets of insulation. And um, because it bothered me and because I'd never heard of this much um, waste in the Great Lakes and the St. Lawrence, um, I wanted to take it home and really examine it. So I spent the better part of a week pulling it apart out of the bag and just examining what was there. And I came to the realization that this wasn't the normal kind of thing or the thing that I grew up with along the St. Lawrence. This was much denser. It was much more numerous in the, the types of garbage that I was seeing. And uh, I'll just go on here. I'll show you an example of it. This is um, 
This is a sort of a cutaway of a milk jug, a gallon milk jug um, that you would you know, find in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, 2010s. So, you know, this one's been rolling around on a beach for how long, I don't know, but it's starting to break down um, and it's being cut away. And to me, it just looked like um, this kind of armor that was sort of falling apart. So I wanted to shoot it in a light that would, you know, give it um, sort of a, you know, more dignity than it really deserves. Um, but I wanted people to see it and to take notice of it and to become aware of like what is going on out there on the beaches. It's, you know, everybody that I talked to when I was doing, starting this project was like, oh yeah, it's like the garbage oceans out in the Pacific and the Atlantic. And I started to think about that too when I was collecting um, at Lake Superior in 2018. And what I found was that it's actually quite different. In the garbage islands of the oceans of the world, the garbage swirls in this big mass and it, it gets caught in nets and it, you know, basically starts to break down and it gets into the food system. And he, in, in the Great Lakes in the St. Lawrence Seaway, it's different. It um, actually slides along the edges in the shorelines and starts to break down faster. Um, and this came out of an article, this, this idea and this um, theory comes out of an article from uh, a doctor of mathematics in, um, at the Rochester Institute of Technology. His name is um, Matthew Hoffman. And he developed um, a model which says that there is roughly about 10,000 tons of garbage that goes into the Great Lakes and the St. Lawrence Seaway every year. And that it uh, rides the currents from Lake Superior right out to um, the Gulf of St. Lawrence. And on its way, if it's floating or semi-floating, it's actually rubbing against the shoreline or rocks and things like that. So it's breaking down quite a bit. And this I found really quite interesting because it, it means that to me, that this plastic is breaking down and then going into the food chain a little bit faster than what you would think. The other thing is that for every piece of garbage that I picked up, I can only imagine how many actually sank to the bottom and how much has been sitting there since you know the 60s. So that got me thinking as well. So after collecting you know, a generous amount from this one beach, one location in uh, Lake Superior Provincial Park, I decided to look at um, seven more um, locations along the seaway. And it ended up being a, a, a two-year project, two and a half years, um, which thankfully, um, I concluded that the travel portion of it just after uh, the pandemic uh, came to be. Um, so it includes a location Lake Michigan, Lake Superior, Lake Huron, Lake St. Clair, which is a really quite an interesting place. Uh, Lake Erie in Ontario, of course. There's also um, two locations along the St. Lawrence Seaway, one in Quebec City and one just outside of Montreal. And my fear um, when I first started this was that you know, I would go to these locations and I wouldn't find anything. But yeah, I found a lot uh, in all of those locations, uh, very different things uh, and a lot of the same thing. Um, so anyway, I'll, show, uh, I'll share this with you as well. This is, um, this is from 2019. Um, this is Michigan Man after Archambolo. And uh, at the west side of, of Lake Michigan, there are uh, great sand dunes there. And uh, Amy and I and my wife, we went there again and hiked a bit and, and stayed there for, for a week. And I found this one beach, which is just south of one of the state parks. And it was quite secluded and remote. Um, and I picked up all of this within about 10, 15 minutes and more. There's actually, this is just a sampling of it. But at, 
when I came back, I had been looking and reading a lot about uh, Archambolo, uh, Gillespie Archambolo, who was a painter um, who would take the, the, the elements of the, the, the person that he was painting a portrait of and put it into the portrait and make that person of those things. And what I mean by that is if, I'll give you an example, if they were a librarian or somebody that was interested in books, he would create their portrait by painting um, books and pages and bindings um, into the shape of who they were. So I've been consuming a lot of this imagery and um, it so happened that one day, um, like everybody, I was, I was going downstairs to check on the wash and I had about 15 minutes before the wash had to be switched over to the dryer. And so I just sat down and, and like most of the time, most of these collection pieces will be out drying or just, uh, just out in full view so that I can see them when I pass by. And I just sat down and I just started to think about uh, putting these elements together in the shape of a face and a head. And, and you know, this is pretty close to what the, what the original idea was. Um, but after about 10 to 15 minutes, um, I had a pretty good start on this. And I really wanted to, to again, show what was, um, what I found in these locations um, and what they, um, what the, what was happening there. And I just wanted to do it in a little bit different way than just the straight um, picture and depiction of, of that one singular piece. I wanted to put this one together. Uh, this has been very successful for me. Um, it's won um, a Figure Works Award in 2019, at the end of 2019, and uh, it's one of the better, um, one of the more crowd pleasing pieces, if you want to call it that. Uh, I enjoy it. It, it represents a um, sort of a creative um, opening for me, which is quite nice. Uh, and lastly, um, part of this, uh, this is a styrofoam cloud. I collected this actually um, in 2018, the end of 2018. There's a bird sanctuary uh, in Lake Ontario, which is located on the opposite side of the sandbanks. That's um, the Prince Edward uh, Bird Sanctuary. And, and if you can ever get there, uh, I recommend it. It's a beautiful spot. And there had... Um, a different type of beach than what you would find at the sandbanks, the provincial park there. Uh, it's more of a rocky shore. And I kept finding um, these large chunks of um, styrofoam. And I found this little piece, this is only about the size of about a quarter or so. Um, and I found this little piece and when I picked it up, it looked um, like, you know, just like a little piece of, of plastic. And I put it in the bag and I came home and I looked at it again and all I could see was a cloud. And so I just, I just lit it in a certain way and just put it together so that it would give me that sense of, of, um, of being a cloud. And um, it's sort of a signature piece for the project because it, um, anyway, you can read into it or whatever you like, but it's, it's, it's one of the ones that I like quite a bit. And that's really about it. Um, I'll, uh, I'll stop sharing here. So yeah, I, that's who I am and that's the projects that I do. Um, I wanna thank again, the Ottawa Arts Council, the Ottawa Art Gallery and SPAO, the School of Photographic Arts Ottawa. Um, I encourage you to support all three of these um, organizations here in Ottawa. And again, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the honor of the 2020 Project X Award. And uh, I wish everyone um, good health and to be safe. Thank you. Bye.